During the Easter weekend in April 1992, Dana Yule informed his relatives that he couldn't reach his parents, Dale and Glee Yule, and his sister, Tiffany Yule. Dana was still at the family's California beach house, where he had spent the weekend with his girlfriend and her father, an FBI agent. Upon the housekeeper's arrival for duty following the Easter weekend, the discovery she made in the house sent chills down her spine. The distressed housekeeper rushed to a neighbor's home, prompting an immediate call to the police who arrived at the scene of the grim discovery of the three lifeless bodies. Initially presumed to be a botched burglary, it was soon determined that nothing had been stolen, leading authorities to conclude it was a planned murder. But who could have had a motive to kill this innocent family? Investigations ensued, eliminating several potential suspects until one unlikely person emerged as the prime suspect. This is the horrifying case of the Ewell family. Dale Ewell was born in Ohio during the Great Depression, instilling in him a strong work ethic and appreciation for every single dollar he earned. His upbringing in a family that endured economic hardship likely fueled his determination and ambition. After serving in the Air Force, Dale found success as a businessman, eventually becoming the president and owner of Western Piper Sales Incorporated, a company that specialized in selling small aircraft. He expanded his financial ventures by investing in several farms with profits from Western Piper. Dale had married Glee Michelle, a woman who taught in elementary school, worked as a translator for the CIA, and served on a commission at the State Bar of California. Together, they became parents, welcoming Tiffany in 1967 and Dana in 1971. Dale's achievements afforded the Ewell family a comfortable residence in Sunnyside, a beachfront property in Pajaro Dunes, as well as luxury automobiles and designer clothes. The primary source of the Ewell's income stemmed from the sale of light aircraft and extensive investments in the stock market. Having established his aviation enterprise successfully, Dale ventured into purchasing several farms, ultimately amassing significant wealth. Dale and Glee's combined net worth was estimated at $8 million, portraying them as the epitome of the American dream, even though they maintained a modest lifestyle. While Tiffany followed in her parents' footsteps, Dana diverged significantly from their path. While attending university, Dana Ewell portrayed himself as a prosperous entrepreneur, asserting that he was the source of his family's wealth. His fabricated narrative garnered attention from a local newspaper and even made its way into Ewell's school yearbook in 1990. Enrolled at Santa Clara University, Dana was preoccupied with notions of affluence and stylish living. He possessed a BMW and had access to funds enabling him to indulge in luxury items such as jewellery at his leisure. In contrast, his older sister Tiffany, who graduated from Fresno University, exhibited a more down-to-earth demeanour. From a young age, Dana displayed a tendency to lie a lot and fabricated many of his stories. Despite his exceptional intellect and education, Dana's aspirations transcended mere comfort, wealth and a promising future. He shared his father's ambition, but lacked the determination to pursue his goals through legitimate means. Even during his time as a student at the University of Santa Clara, Dana felt compelled to concoct grandiose tales of his achievements and importance, which were entirely false. He proved to be a pathological liar, deceiving both faculty and peers into believing he was the head of a multi-million dollar enterprise. Within his intricate web of lies, he portrayed himself as having begun his career as a stockbroker at the age of 18, subsequently transitioning to aircraft sales and ultimately ascending to the presidency of his own aircraft manufacturing company. The underlying tension within the father-son dynamic characterized by dwindling communication remained largely concealed from others. Dana's habit of fabricating outlandish tales about himself likely caused embarrassment for his father and could have led to conflicts between them. Despite Dale's upbringing in modest circumstances and his generous support for his children, it appeared that Dana harbored an insatiable sense of entitlement. Despite his privileged upbringing, Dana Ewell portrayed himself as a self-absorbed, egotistical individual primarily focused on his own wealth and social status. On Sunday, April 19, 1992, Sunnyside, California experienced mild, partly sunny weather, creating an ideal Easter Sunday afternoon atmosphere. Dale, aged 59, along with his 57-year-old wife Glee and their 24-year-old daughter Tiffany, had spent the Easter weekend at their beach house. 
Glee and Tiffany returned directly to Sunnyside by car, while Dale opted to fly his private plane to his hangar before driving home. Unbeknownst to them, upon their arrival home after their two-and-a-half-hour journey, they were ambushed almost immediately upon entering. Tiffany was fatally shot in the head first, followed shortly by Glee, who was shot multiple times. Thirty minutes later, as Dale arrived in the driveway, unaware of the tragedy that had befallen his family, he too was fatally shot as he opened the door from the garage into the house. The perpetrator, having stayed in the house, lay in wait for Dale, who had no idea that he had very little time left to live. Two days later, 21-year-old Dana Yule, the youngest member of the family, reached out to relatives and friends in Sunnyside, expressing his inability to reach his parents. Despite residing with his parents, Dana had spent the Easter weekend in San Francisco, around 200 miles away, with his girlfriend Monica Zent and her father John Zent, an FBI agent. On Tuesday, April 21, 1992, the Yule's longtime housekeeper, Juanita Avenita, arrived for her usual work duties. Upon entering the kitchen, she discovered Tiffany's lifeless body lying face down in a pool of blood, her hands tucked beneath her. Distraught, the housekeeper sought help from a neighbor, prompting a call to the police. Meanwhile, Dana was still in Monterey, California, at the time of the murders. Upon being contacted by the authorities, his girlfriend's father promptly arranged for Dana to fly to Fresno. Dana appeared visibly distressed throughout the ordeal. Subsequently, the police embarked on an extensive investigation, dedicating numerous days to gathering evidence and interviewing witnesses. The crime scene was meticulously staged to resemble a failed robbery, but seasoned detectives recognized the signs of a premeditated burglary designed to make it appear as though the family stumbled upon the intruder and was subsequently murdered. Upon closer inspection, detectives noted several anomalies. The absence of weapons, bloodstains, footprints, or DNA evidence. Instead, the detectives observed a methodically planned and executed attack. The precision of the assailant's shots was remarkable, with only one miss, and the perpetrator had even retrieved the spent bullet casings. Inside the home, investigators discovered a box of 9mm ammunition purchased by Dale, later determined to have been used in the killings. Although the home gave the appearance of being ransacked, no valuable items were actually taken. There were no signs of forced entry through windows or doors, and the alarm, typically activated, had been deactivated. The scene seemed deliberately arranged to suggest a burglary in progress upon the Ewell's return. Investigators meticulously delved into the backgrounds of the victims, searching for any clues that might link to their homicides. Dale's past involvements, including selling airplanes for an individual later convicted of drug smuggling in the 1970s, and a problematic real estate transaction with his brother that threatened to cost investors millions underwent thorough scrutiny. However, both incidents were eventually dismissed as having no connection to the murders. The police systematically eliminated all other potential suspects with motives, ultimately focusing their attention on Dana, who stood to benefit greatly from the tragedy. Being the sole survivor of the Ewell family and the primary beneficiary of the estate, Dana naturally became a person of interest. Despite having a seemingly airtight alibi, being in the company of his girlfriend and her FBI agent father at the time of the murders, police couldn't shake their suspicions about him. Dana's behavior did little to assuage their concerns, only serving to heighten their intuition regarding his involvement. Despite outward displays of distress over the murders, including offering rewards for information and even a $50,000 reward for the capture of the killer, Dana's grief appeared disingenuous. His emotional response to the brutal slaying of his own family seemed lacking, failing to convey the expected horror and anguish. Instead, his focus appeared to be primarily on matters related to his parents' wills and inheritance, rather than mourning the tragic loss of his loved ones. In a particularly unsettling move, he even invited a friend to tour the house, where bloodstains and spatter were still visible, displaying a disturbing lack of sensitivity. Allegedly, he even expressed disdain for the police investigation, claiming they were a bunch of dummies that would never solve the case. Thus began a prolonged and tense game of cat and mouse between Dana and the authorities, spanning three gruelling years as they pursued every possible lead. Adding fuel to the escalating conflict, Dale's brothers reached out to authorities, accusing their nephew of wrongdoing. They alleged that during the reading of the wills, 
Dana had flown into a rage upon learning that trust provisions would restrict his access to the $8 million estate until he reached his 30s. According to their account, Dana had even slammed his fist on the desk and shouted, How could he have done this to me? referring to his father. The arrangement stipulated that his parents would cover his expenses until he turned 25, followed by receiving investment dividends until he reached 30. Half of it would be accessible to him at the age of 30, with the remaining half available at 35. Before the funerals for Dale, Glee and Tiffany, the Ewell brothers took steps to hinder Dana's efforts to claim what he believed was rightfully his. However, Dana managed to secure around $300,000 from an insurance policy that either wasn't subject to the trust provisions or had been overlooked by mistake. Dana's uncles, his father's three brothers, were actively preventing him from inheriting any portion of his father's assets and wealth, causing significant frustration for Dana. Despite the mounting pressure from investigators closing in on him and accusations from members of his extended family implicating him in the murders as a ploy to gain control of the family estate, Dana continued to live his life seemingly unaffected. He continued to spend money recklessly, splurging on lavish gifts for his girlfriend Monica and even contributing towards her educational expenses. However, the source of his seemingly endless funds remained a puzzle. Suspecting that money played a significant role in the murders, investigators intensified their scrutiny. They uncovered evidence indicating that Dana had been embezzling money from various sources, including his grandmother's $400,000 trust account. By the time detectives intervened, the elderly woman had been left with a mere $2,000 to cover her ongoing care expenses at a nursing facility. The revelation that Dana had exploited his vulnerable grandmother for financial gain only solidified the police's suspicions about his character. Despite this damning discovery, authorities still needed conclusive evidence linking Dana to the murders before they could make an arrest. One of Dana's college acquaintances who was usually captivated by his elaborate tales and his portrayal of a pampered, affluent lifestyle was one Joel Radovcic. Joel found Dana intriguing, especially his wealth, success and apparent ability to effortlessly attract the most attractive women. People around them were puzzled about what they had in common, as they were as different as night and day. While Dana sought higher social status, Joel was more interested in video games, firearms and explosives. Despite their disparities, Joel's friendship with Dana provided him access to exclusive parties and introductions to desirable women. Shortly after the murders, Joel had dropped out of school. As mentioned earlier, within weeks of the Ewell family's tragic demise, he visited their home for a tour, eventually becoming Dana's roommate in the same residence. Joel's association with Dana marked a crucial turning point in the investigation. Both Dana and Joel began making unusual cash purchases, such as helicopter piloting lessons, despite Joel lacking an apparent source of income. As a result, both individuals came under surveillance, and investigators observed their communication, which was through sophisticated pages and payphones. Authorities had Dana's pager cloned and wiretapped his landline. In May 1993, Joel was overheard by an officer conversing on a payphone where he was recorded saying, they don't have evidence, they will try to catch you in a lie. On another occasion he was heard advising, just play the game. And without a doubt Dana continued playing the game, buying his girlfriend a new car and covering her law school tuition. After exhausting the insurance payout, as previously mentioned, he built $400,000 from his grandmother's account, leaving her with only $2,000 to cover her nursing home expenses. In 1994, investigators shifted their focus to forensic analysis, which revealed that the murder weapon was a specialized 9mm assault rifle manufactured in Colorado. Records from the company indicated that such a rifle had been purchased by one Ernest Jack Ponce shortly before April 1992. Interestingly, Jack happened to be a high school friend of Joel. Upon questioning, Jack initially denied buying the gun and later claimed it was purchased as a birthday gift for himself, unknown to Joel, and alleged that the gun had been stolen. The evidence was mounting against Dana and Joel. At one point, detectives attempted to unsettle Dana during their visit to his university dormitory, informing him of their belief that Joel was responsible for murdering his family. Dana remained silent, his face visibly drained of color. After the detectives departed, unaware they were being observed, Dana and his girlfriend Monica, who was present during the visit, hurriedly made a phone call to Radovcic. On March 2, 1995, the police took action and arrested Dana and Joel. 
Joining them were Peter Radovchich, Joel's brother, and Jack Ponce. Peter had struck a deal with authorities, offering testimony against his brother and Dana in exchange for immunity. He confessed to the police that he had crafted a homemade silencer and attached it to the murder weapon, disposed of the gun barrel, Joel's tennis shoes worn during the killings, and a collection of gun enthusiast magazines. Peter admitted to carrying out these actions in collaboration with Jack Ponce. Upon his arrest, Jack provided a contrasting narrative regarding the firearm. He confessed to purchasing it for Joel, but claimed ignorance about its intended use in the murders. Additionally, he corroborated Peter's account of their joint disposal of evidence. Jack, like Peter, received immunity in exchange for his testimony at trial. As a result of Peter and Jack's statements, the barrel of the murder weapon was located buried in a dirt field in Reseda. Dana and Joel, however, were obviously not offered any plea deals. Instead, they were charged with three counts of first-degree murder and special circumstances, rendering them eligible for the death penalty. The trial didn't commence until late 1997. Dana and Joel, who had once been close enough to travel to Mexico together, share flying lessons, and even live in the same house where Dale, Glee and Tiffany were killed, now had separate legal representation and adopted different stances during the trial. Prosecutors contended that Dana's motive stemmed from greed, alleging that he had promised Joel a portion of the inheritance. Dana's attorney argued for his innocence, claiming that Joel and Jack had planned and carried out the murders. Meanwhile, Joel's attorney, acknowledging the weight of the evidence against his client, aimed to save him from the death penalty. During his testimony, Jack Ponce revealed that he not only purchased the murder weapon for Joel and aided in its disposal, but that Joel had also provided him the details of the events that transpired on that fateful day in April 1992, which he was ready to share. Dana had approached Joel, pleading for a favour which was hard for him to reject. Acting as the executor of Dana's plan, Joel entered the Yule residence with specific instructions. Having meticulously prepared by shaving his entire body, Joel waited patiently for 12 hours, perched on a plastic sheet to avoid leaving any trace of DNA behind, even a small eyelash. He was also instructed to ensure no bullet casings were left at the scene. Tiffany was the first victim, passing by Joel without noticing him before he fatally shot her in the back of the head. Glee, however, caught a glimpse of the assailant and was struck by a bullet. Despite attempting to flee to the office, bleeding profusely, she was pursued and mercilessly shot multiple times by Joel, who then straddled her. In a chilling moment, just before firing the fatal shot, Glee locked eyes with Joel, recognizing him as a friend Dana had introduced to the family a month prior. After fatally shooting Glee, Joel proceeded to change the magazines in the gun and don fresh gloves, awaiting Dale's arrival. He subsequently murdered Dale as well. However, during Jack's testimony recounting Dale's murder from Joel's perspective, he had made a crucial error by mentioning an eye saw the eye, which undermined the credibility of his testimony. The jury viewed his account with skepticism, suspecting greater involvement than he had admitted, but his immunity agreement shielded him from facing charges for the deaths. On May 27, 1998, eight months after the trial commenced, the jury unanimously found Dana Ewell and Joel Radovcic guilty on all charges. However, they were unable to reach a consensus on the sentencing. While two votes spared Joel from the death penalty, Dana narrowly escaped the same fate by only one vote. They both received three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Dana was incarcerated at Corcoran State Prison, located 50 miles south of Fresno, where he found himself among fellow inmates including notorious figures like Charles Manson. Unfortunately, his grandmother, whom he had stolen from, passed away in 1999. In the years following his conviction, Dana professed to have undergone a spiritual transformation, embracing Christianity. He is registered on an online prison pen pal platform, where in part of his profile he states, a finance graduate from Santa Clara University, I was beginning my career in investment banking when some extraordinarily painful events turned my world upside down. Meanwhile, Joel Radovcic was imprisoned at Mule Creek State Prison in Ione, about two hours south of San Francisco, which has housed other infamous inmates such as Tex Watson and Robert John Bardo. Jack Ponce went to law school, eventually becoming an attorney. Monica Zent ended her relationship with Dana, completed her law school studies and established a thriving law practice. 
While Monica was scrutinized during the investigation, no evidence implicating her involvement could be uncovered, aside from her apparent reluctance to engage in the case that led to her boyfriend's convictions for murder and the fact that he had had utilized some of the ill-gotten funds to contribute towards her law school expenses. Greed, entitlement, heartlessness, three words that perfectly described Dana Ewell. Dana's insatiable desire for wealth and his willingness to manipulate and betray those closest to him ultimately led to the brutal demise of his own family. It is sad and unfortunate what befell the victims of this tale at the hands of their avaricious and manipulative brother and son, along with those who aided him. As we reflect on this heart-wrenching tale, our thoughts are with the victims whose lives were tragically cut short and the loved ones they left behind. If you found this video compelling, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel and check out our other videos. Thank you for watching.